workshop for inviting me here. I feel very lucky <laughs> to be to be here. And uh, before I begin my talk on Occupied, um, I will allow myself, uh, encouraged by Pace, to introduce very briefly uh, my uh, recent book, uh, Beyond Eastern War, Reimagining Russia and Eastern Europe in Nordic Cinemas, published earlier this year by Edinburgh University Press. Uh, its subject is uh, partly... This is the book. <laughs> you can take a look if you, if you want. Uh, its, its subject is partly related to the geopolitical focus uh, of this workshop, as it concentrates on how geopolitics related to uh, Russia and Eastern Europe is reflected, either directly or in more implicit manners, in Nordic films and, to a minor degree, television series. Emphasis in my book is on, uh, on films and TV series made after 1989, but I also look at some earlier uh, films, and yeah, mainly films. Uh, I pay particular attention uh, to the neighborly contiguity between the Nordic region and the former Eastern Bloc. The double notion of border boundary uh, functions as the key concept in my study, due to which my focus is uh, narrowed down to four Nordic countries, Norway, uh, Finland, Sweden and Denmark, while representations of uh, neighbors encompass Russia or the former USSR, three Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, Poland and the former uh, German uh, Democratic Republic. The pr principal research problem deals with the question of how the sensitive geopolitical border affected the shape the Eastern European countries and uh, Russia assumed in the Nordic cultural imagination and how this imagination in its complex historical and uh, spatial dynamics is manifested in film and television drama. Throughout the book I employ a twofold optics inquiring how borders not only had an impact on the Nordic conceptions of the Eastern neighbors but also how they prompted a reimagining of the Nordic self. I diagnose a hegemonic narrative relating to Russia and Eastern Europe, which I, which I define using the term uh, Eastern Noir. And you have the sweater here, by the way. <laughs> uh, within this narrative, the countries in question are portrayed as singular crime scene, in a sense by default entailing plot and narrative conventions characteristic of the broadly understood uh, crime story or thriller, suggesting that Russia and Eastern Europe necessitate that very genre convention. The introduction um, and the first chapter of my book are devoted to the Eastern Noir, whereas the five remaining chapters uh, delve into various uh, heterogeneous perspectives applied to Russia and Eastern Europe, which uh, reimagine the hegemonic narrative of Eastern Noir and offer a more nuanced reflection on both the Eastern neighbors and the Nordic South. That was just a very brief introduction to my most recent uh, publication and now to the actual subject of my presentation, Occupied. I define Occupied as eco-Eastern Noir in my, in my book and included actually in chapter one, but uh, as I will attempt to show here, this Norwegian television drama not only adheres to, but also goes beyond the Eastern Noir narrative. Environmental concerns and the relationship between human beings and nature are central to Nordic film cultures, as uh, Pietari Kaffa, among others, has shown in his book Ecology and Contemporary Nordic Cinemas. With television series such as Occupied uh, or Swedish Jordscott, just to name a few, ecological anxieties have made their way into Nordic small screen <coughs> fiction. Despite certain discrepancies, such as nuclear power in Finland and oil-driven economic growth in Norway, the Nordic countries associate themselves with a high level of environmental consciousness. This exceptionalist self-perception is both expressed and questioned in a number of Nordic eco-documentaries, but also fiction films, on Russia, typically imagined as a polar opposite to the neighboring Nordic countries in terms of environmental consciousness and policies. Occupied draws on a number of cultural, historical and geopolitical discourses, including the cluster of narratives that have grown around the Russian-Norwegian border in Finnmark, 
um, the Norwegian resistance movement during World War II, Norwegian alliance with NATO during the Cold War and later, or the so-called fear of Russia, in the case of Norway reaching back at least to the early 20th century. One of the central discourses, both evoked and subverted in the series, is that of the Nordic eco-exceptionalism. The references to a specific ecological self-perception occupied both problematizes Norway's geopolitical relations and negotiates, as I will attempt to show, the official Norwegian national self-perception. Occupied imagines the Norwegian eco-exceptionalism in the near future, shortly after environmental catastrophe caused by climate change, confronting this exceptionalism with Norway's close neighbor and at the same time its greatest ecological other, uh, Russia. The eco-exceptionalist discourse in focus can be defined in my own term as a white ecology, a narrative constructing the Nordic countries as a place of unspoiled nature and high environmental awareness. I understand white ecology as a variant of the romanticizing and romantic idealizing discourse on the nature, usually termed as green ecology, which according to literary scholar Timothy Morton, depicts nature in positive terms as harmonious and beautiful, overlooking what is ugly, toxic, unpredictable, and destructive in nature. Such a construction implies that humans, perceiving themselves as separated from nature, can rule over the natural world and be responsible for its uh, growth and well-being. White, <clears throat> white ecology combines the green ecological approach with Nordic national discourse, and I focus here specifically on its Norwegian variant, in cinema fre frequently coded in shots displaying majestic sunlit winter landscapes with uh, mountains, fjords and the sea, providing the viewer with sublime spectacle and visual pleasure. However, landscape is here not only a source of contemplative experience for the viewers, but also a layer encoding various cultural and national references. This fact of employing nature in the name of specific um, discourses exhibits an anthropocentric uh, approach as such. One iconic example uh, of such a role played by landscape in Norwegian cinema is the Cold War action, action drama, some of you may know it, uh, Orion's Belt from 18, uh, 18, uh, 1985, uh, in which winter landscapes <clears throat> adhering to official Norwegian uh, self-representations um, are explicitly entangled in the Cold War geopolitics. And I mention this film here uh, not least because there are multiple references to Orion's Belt in Occupied, um, as you, including the role of the helicopter, as you can see in these two images. You have the helicopter here and here, and it's the Russian helicopter, um, which is important. Uh, especially modern Norwegian national discourse is shaped in relation to environment and ecological threats. As argued by Sabina Birgitte Handling Stromme, in recent decades, protection of the environment has grown to become quote, a key concern of, uh, at the center of Norwegian-ness, unquote. Moreover, as Henry Strommel shows, in Norwegian uh, culture and cinema, the dominant national discourse represented by white frozen land is often associated with white masculinity as a symbol of Norwegian nationality. The Nordic exceptionalism can be here linked to the image of young men handling uh, Stromer's examples being the Norwegian polar explorers and national heroes uh, Fridolf Jensen and Roald uh, Amundsen struggling against and eventually mastering extreme nat natural conditions. I will return to this uh, combination of white landscape uh, aesthetics and masculinity with eco-exceptional discour discourse in Occupied. Representing ecological threat within the Nordic-Russian transnational frame enhances the exceptionalist discourse, according to which a country or region is seen by its own society as more advanced than others and thus entitled to teach others. The conviction of Norway's political, cultural and moral superiority 
is expressed and occupied through the conviction of ecological superiority of Norway over Russia, the North over the East, which of course recalls the old Cold War binarisms and hints to the contemporary so-called New Cold War. Enhancing the Norwegian's sense of chosenness and opposed to the Nordic white ecology, Russia and occupied can be seen as representing dark ecology, mainly because Russians take over the Norwegian oil industry, and I will return to this. Um, this dark ecology is here embodied by the Russian ambassador to Norway, uh, Irina Sidorova. Dark ecology, a term coined by uh, Morton, refers to the aspects of nature that are, o that are overlooked within the uh, romanticiz romanticizing green discourse. Russia is where the sick and the dangerous powers in nature, as a result of human activities and the belief in the progress industrialization can bring, come to the surface and threaten the lives of human beings. This process, resulting from the human command and control approach to environment, is called by Morton a strange loop imagined by a serpent eating its own tail. In Morton's words, the consequences of such an approach involve, quote, an unexpected fallout from the myth of progress. For every seeming forward motion of the drill bit, there is a backwards duration, an asymmetrical contrary motion, unquote. However, this white dark binarism is also challenged in, uh, challenged in Occupied, and this is what I'm going to focus on in the following. The plot in Occupied Starts, begins after Norway's left-wing government, following a natural disaster, cuts all oil and natural gas production in order to fight climate, climate change or to unloop the strange loop. The first action scene features Norway's Prime Minister, Jesper Berg, being kidnapped and swept away in a Russian helicopter, following which he's blackmailed, blackmailed into accepting an unusual agreement with Russia. The agreement, backed by the European Union, states that Russia can take control of Norway's oil, plat oil platforms and secure a continuous energy supply to Europe. As a consequence, Russia begins soft occupation of Norway. The narrative opens in April, the month associated with the occupation of Norway, but also Denmark, by Nazi Germany in 1940. There is still snow in the woods where Jesper Berg is released from the helicopter after he has agreed to both Russia and the EU's conditions. A close-up of his face, opening episode one, cuts to traces of blood on the snow. The blood is that of a, a witness to the kidnapping killed by the Russians. Thus, even if the occupation is soft, that is, without bloodshed, it is nevertheless blood that marks the first traces left by Russians on the Norwegian soil. It seems that the link between the victorious Norwegian masculinity and winter landscape is here both evoked and challenged. The killed elderly male witness is shown lying dead in the snow, while later in the series another male character, the independent journalist Thomas investigating the Russians, is found dead close to the Russian-Norwegian border in Finnmark. Moreover, Berg's identification with nature, his name meaning um, mountain in Norwegian, can be seen as an ironic reference to the Norwegian national discourse of mastering nature by a man. Berg's green policy expose, is exposed in the series as thoroughly uh, anthropocentric and driven by his hunger for power. Although Russia represents dark ecology, the threat associated with uh, Russians also critically evokes the self-perception of Norway as the green Samaritan on the planet, as Helen Stromer put it. Norwegians' environmental concerns are depicted as having global aspirations that they believe Europe and the whole world should embrace. The series exposes this discourse as written with self-complacency. This self-inflicted role as Europe's savior is highlighted by the fact that Norway is left alone by all other Western countries, including their Scandinavian, Scandinavian brothers supporting the EU's alliance with Russia. At the same time, Norway's uh, universalizing approach and hence the negligence of borders and cultural and economic differences 
embodies the type of exceptionalism which, um, to quote Ebbe Volkwartsen, um, resting on a notion of ethical and moral superiority, justifies well-intentioned Nordic intervention in the crisis areas." Unquote. These aspirations are not just incapacitated by the Russians. Russia also ridicules Western and specifically Nordic discourses and patterns of behavior. Imitating Nordic exceptionalism, Russia forces Norway into a position in which only, usually only remote, crisis-ridden, poverty-stricken countries are depicted. It is Norway who, according to the more influential and resourceful Russians, needs intervention. Russians think that Norwegians should be rescued from their own environmentalist government. Therefore, Norway, Norway is offered generous help. Mimicking Nordic discourses and helping Norway in the interest of gaining political and economic global influence, Russia questions the idea of righteousness to which these discourses normally make claims. Most importantly, Occupied indicates that the ecological threat and therefore the threat to Norwegianness, that is fossil fuel, has been generated by the Norwegians themselves. Oil is their sin and their ecological bad conscience, a dark ecology they seek to suppress by implementing green policies and employing majestic white landscapes in official self-depictions. But rather than connoting the sublime, snow in occupied functions as a white canvas on which the traces of misdeeds, such as blood connoting both transgression and guilt, are made visible, but which can also be quickly covered by a new white layer. The implication that this sin um, uh, is located at the very center of power is reinforced by the cunning choice of the producers to locate the fictitious uh, Norwegian <laughs> parliament um, in the real existing buildings of Statoil, the worldwide non Norwegian energy company. Indeed, if nature is seen as a symbol of the Norwegian nation, then the threat to Norwegianness can, can be interpreted as the oil boom that started in the 1970s. The resulting societal affluence is often perceived as having proved uh, destructive for the values that earlier defined the Norwegian society. Such an understanding is supported and occupied by the nostalgic discourse of the national pre-oil past, with references to World War II and the resistance movement. Another Norwegian sin the encounter with the Russian other exposes is the appropriation of nature by national discourses and for the purpose of branding one's own exceptional identity internationally and globally rather than truly prioritizing nature. This sin is embodied by Berg. Well, worth mentioning when Berg stays in Paris seeking political asylum in season two, he met, meets his former partner who accuses him of not caring for environment any longer. Thus, the image of Russia as the source of evil ricochets back on Norway. Russia only takes control of the threat that already emerges from the center of the Norwegian political and ecological self, signaled in the initial juxtaposition of Berg's face with the traces uh, of blood. The confrontation with the Russian ecological other perforates the exceptionalist Norwegian, Norwegian national discourse. First, by functioning as a space where the dark ecology comes to the surface, Russia uncovers what is suppressed in the romanticizing discourse, while it at the same time exposes its normativity. It demonstrates that the eco-utopian ideal of living in harmony with nature, as advocated by Berg's party, while at the same time mastering nature, is an illusion. Rather, it testifies to Theodor Adorno's point evoked by Morton that creation of society is motivated by the need to defend oneself against dangerous and violent, violent elements in nature and that establishing borders, whether to ecological or political or national others, is more important than true ecological concerns. Not only the Nordic society, but also the idea of Norden built on exceptionalist discourses seems dependent on, dependent on drawing up borders towards the presumed others. 
at the end of season two, uh, Burke finds himself on top of the mountain again, the last, the last shot showing him behind the Prime Minister's desk. But his return to power brings to mind Macbeth, rather than the glorious Norwegian <laughs> polar explorers, uh, while it at the same time can be, can be interpreted as exposing this white ecological national narrative as much less victorious than it might seem. To conclude, Occupied can be seen as adhering to the self-critical approaches to Nordic exceptionalism in recent Nordic literature and film, as discussed, for example, by Ebbe Volgotsen. Geopolitically, this exceptionalism is both expressed and undermined by invoking the Nordic region's closest and, at the same time, greatest ecological other, Russia. But rather than simply functioning as Norden's ultimate opposite, the dark Russia serves to deconstruct the white ecology of Nordic national self-depictions. Thus, the fear of Russia acquires a playful twist in Occupied. Russia is threatening not only because of its imperialist inclinations, but also because it awakens Norway's own inner fears and guilt. Referring very briefly to the question of how geopolitical television series may impact real-life uh, politics, brought up by Robert uh, in your article, it should be mentioned that the production of Occupied caused a critique by uh, Russian authorities. This, in fact, reminds of similar reactions of the Soviet authorities towards Orion's Belt, who issued official protests describing the film as an unfriendly act against uh, the USSR. However, whereas in the mid-1980s uh, Norwegian cinema was pressured into various forms of self-censorship when dealing with delicate geopolitical issues, this cannot be claimed about uh, Occupied, where Russians are explicit invaders and enemies. Therefore, my very tentative uh, conclusion, or maybe question, would be that the series manifests uh, a very limited or even lacking fear towards the Russians in contemporary Norwegian society. Thank you. Thank you.